when I made my last film, The Time That Remains, I was hoping somehow, um, when I saw it, that would, this would be the end of the line for, you know, cutting entirely and finally the umbilical cord with this town uh, that I, you know, came to also have a lot of confusion about my emotion towards it, mostly negative. Um, <coughs> and, um, and then the result was not totally satisfying for me. I'm going to go back again uh, because I have not really finished from it somewhat. While in this film, I can see that just the contrary was, was happening, was the approaching, you know, I was living in New York at the moment, having been there quite a few times, of course. I mean, I would go there often. Um, but it was the beginning of interrogating my sense of identity to the place. And, I, and um, so you, you have you know, this insider, outsider initiating um, in this film. Um, <clears throat> I think that um, I, have, I may have resolved a lot of the issues that I was trying to tackle in this film, mainly the issue of belonging and ma mainly the issue of identity. Um, because I do not believe in identity anymore, and I have um, no particular attachment to any nationality. I may have experienced that in the Chronicle of Disappearance in a conceptual way, but I think today, I, at least I rid myself of this sort of you know, ident identity and rather transported it somewhere beyond borders. And I have to say that the only thing that is still left is the familiarity with the place. Um, you know, it's, I, and I happen to have filmed all my films in the same place, more or less, the same house, which is my parents' house. Uh, my parents acted in the film, in the first and the second, and the third, actually, they have uh, at this moment passed away. So, <clears throat> but uh, I still have to get rid of it one way or another because I... I do, don't I like this place? I don't, in fact. And I think that uh, with this film there was also an engagement of emotion since my, par my parents have passed away and I had my mother not long time ago. So I was not exactly looking at the mistakes that I was making when I made this film, but some places I was rather bored, I have to say. Uh, were you? <laughs> okay. <laughs> If somebody wants to ask or you want to ask, I can... Um, I don't know if people also... I mean, I, I was asking myself when I was watching, this film <coughs> was made in a particular context somehow, and I have no idea. Like there was some, some coded language here and there that have to do with the very phase, historic phase of this time. Mainly it was the the Oslo Accord, and so the girl singing about Oslo and uh, Gaza, Jericho, uh, and this voyage, you know, this trip that he, he takes from Jerusalem to, to, uh, to Jericho, to back to Nazareth. And <coughs> since Oslo no longer exists, um, I wonder how some of that can be comprehended. Uh, I was asking myself, it's been a long time. Oslo has died many years ago. I think also that, the, I mean, I'm, I'm talking almost from a position of a spectator because I happen to watch the film, so I'm, I'm asking myself the question. I, I don't know if I have all the answer for myself, but I also noticed that at this moment there was still a sense of tenderness to the place that I just saw, and that sort of tenderness, you know, kind of shifted position slowly because not long after that, it was chaos, and there was basically war, and uh, and the, the Nazareth has become a real rough uh, place to live in. It, it changed in a way, and that I think um, uh, I think was portrayed in Divine Intervention. You have you have more. I mean, here there there are severe frames, but I, I in Divine they are more strict and more cruel, and the people are portrayed in a more cruel way. Here, there's still some harmony between the, the people. That I liked. 
I'm, I'm extremely politicized. Um, you cannot escape, I mean, I, don't, I think, in a way, we live a very political world, and everything we touch, uh, every tomato we cut, has a political background to it, where it comes from, what sort of chemicals entered into it, where it was, uh, where it was planted, who picked it up, what, what sort of wage this person you know, was paid. So I do not think that there is something that is devoid of politics. Um, I'm, I'm quite politicized because I want to be politicized and not necessarily with a geo, you know, political specificity that is, i.e. Israel-Palestine. Um, in this case, I think I was mentioning earlier that I think the, the issue has become not identity but identification and I think there's a major difference between those two. I do not want to be ghettoized in any kind of nationality that exercises any kind of exclusion or inclusion on anyone. And I think that, uh, yes, I do, for example, have all my affiliation and familiarity and, and identification and sympathy with the Palestinian people, but I do not have any sympathy for state building of any kind anywhere. So I think, uh, and I said many times, and it may have caused controversy to some people, because I understand that, that Palestinians, when they say we want a state, it's because they have you know, another metaphor to that state, which is that they do not and no longer want a soldier you know, or a tank outside their doorsteps when schoolboys are going to school, and that is absolutely um, justice asking. Um, but uh, statehood as a, as a political machinery does not mean a thing to me. I'm filled with anecdotes tonight, so if you don't mind. I mean, if somebody wants to ask me, I have a specific cinematic question, I'll be happy to answer, but I just remembered, I, again, it's so much memory. I just remembered so many anecdotes. You know, when I wanted to produce this film, um, it was so hard to produce it, because not a single producer I approached wanted to produce it, especially in France. I didn't know you at the time. Um, <laughs> Um, and most of the rejections were uh, with letters suggesting that there is nothing Palestinian in the script because at this moment, you know, the, especially you know, in Europe and particularly in France where they, were, or they felt very close to the Palestinian reality or they, you know, they could patronize it somehow and the humor was something they, they felt was immoral uh, or was something quite alien uh, to the film, and that there was no confrontation. In other words, there was not a single, you know, real violent image. Um, they were maybe thirsty for some Israelis killing Palestinians or something that would, you know, react to reality. So it was very difficult. I ended up actually uh, producing the film myself. And boy, did I make mistakes. And you know, I just remember another thing, you know, because you say to shoot in Israel, um, basically, uh, first film, this film was really problematic in the sense of, uh, you know, since I was producing and it, it, cinema was not very common, in fact, not in Nazareth and not even elsewhere. So there was no, like today, so many people know about film production. Um, and in fact, my film was a kind of, uh, not the first one at all, but one of the few that initiated, um, uh, you know, uh, teaching some local Palestinians uh, techni technical things, like uh, one, my, the assistant cinematographer here, for example, I imposed that person on the cinematographer. Normally, you know, it's the cinematographer who, cho who chooses, but I wanted absolutely that there will be a technical crew that would come out of this ready to actually roll on and make other films. And that was very, very difficult. A lot of mistakes were done, and uh, there was a lot of tension between the Israelis and the Palestinians on the set because the, the, uh, the crew was like French and Israeli and Palestinian. And nobody from the Israeli side would believe that I am the producer because how could a Palestinian be a producer? And you know, this is a power position. Um, so they would, they would not listen to me sometime and go to the line producer, who I hired. Um, so it was really a, a very strange moment to make, uh, to make film. Um, and 
then I developed a strategy because I work now with a very kind uh, man who's a very close friend of mine, uh, who's Israeli and who is my line producer on my films. And what we do is that he goes to ask for the permissions, let's say, and uh, he's completely not only Israeli but from Tel Aviv and he's totally Ashkenazi. So he poses in front of the army and in front of the police and he, he, he goes and I stay behind. And this is how we manage a lot of the permissions and the way to get equipment because if you want to get a gun, you, you know, if, if, even if it's a false gun, you have to actually you know, get the permission for all of that. So this, is, this part has, you know, has gone more smoothly. Of course, not in everything, you know, like uh, uh, it was not uh, easy to, uh, well, they, didn't, they turned us down when we asked uh, for a tank uh, in divine intervention that we exploded. Um, the Israeli army didn't like the idea very much. Uh, they thought it was not funny. Uh, I thought it was very funny, but, but the French thought it was very funny, and it was the French actually that gave us the tank. So we shot that scene in France. And, um, and in the last one, the time that remains, I w we went again for another tank, uh, and this time not to, not to destroy it, but to use it. And they wanted a thank you credit on my film. Now they got to know me, so they knew I would not do that. Uh, so they turned it down again. So, but it's uh, they 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 have humor at least. Good evening. Uh, how has been the re how has been the reception of your movies uh, in Israel, both by Palestinians and um, and Jews, since the beginning of your career? Has it changed? I suppose no. <laughs> um, for starting from this one, from Chronicle of a Disappearance, um, it was really uh, a volcanic reaction. Uh, and I, I lived um, very troubling moments in my life after this film. It was a hit in Israel for the cinephile and the cinematics, and it got raving reviews. And I was banned and tabooed and fatwas and by the Arab world. Um, when I say the Arab world, I'm just me mean the few, um, you know, critics and spectators that saw the film. You know, you don't have a lot of, you know, places for such a film in in, in the Arab world. Not to speak anywhere else, in fact. But in the Arab world, it, you know, it gets to festivals. Maybe it gets to a couple of places where people screen it. But um, those people who more or less are attached to the juntas. And you know, as you probably know, you know, the Arab world is majority uh, archaic uh, systems, juntas with either, uh, you know, uh, dictators or sheikhs. And they have uh, also their critics, their cinema critics. In other words, you know, the papers are owned or controlled or, or the, the critics would like to ask lick. You never know how those things go. Uh, but they came down on the film, partially, again, the humor. And I was accused of being a Zionist collaborator, and I was not allowed to enter many festivals, and they, they really, I was physically threatened, and uh, with a few occasions of near, near real violence, and uh, I was kind of saved out of a few places. Uh, if we're talking text, there are many, many people that um, may have inspired me. Uh, visually, but if I always think about one person, it would be actually uh, Primo Levi. And uh, I, I think since when I started to read Primo Levi, I, and it has nothing to do with literal visual translation, um, but this is what's interesting, I think, about when people ask you, ask me, well, you know, who inspired, which filmmakers inspired you, and. There are quite a few, I can name them, but I think sometimes the way a tender sentence can enter into a visual translation without, without you being conscious of it, just because this writer actually taught you or is teaching you every time you do read that sentence um, to try to be good to yourself and to try to be good to others. And that by itself can translate into frames and can translate into animation and choreography and tenderness. Um, and I think I would say definitely Primo Levi had that effect since I started reading him. And I was telling a journalist the other day, I, I, you know, between living in New York and Nazareth and Paris and, and nowhere else, you know, but I, I started to keep a book 
in every place so that I do not, you know, miss if I need sometimes. And um, sometimes if I don't have a joint around, I read a sentence from Primo Levi. So, you got it now, okay. Uh, so, because sometimes you feel low uh, spiritually and you feel really that you need to have a, uh, uh, to be consoled, in fact. And uh, there are a few writers that do that, uh, do that to me. Uh, but he primarily, I would say, he, he kind of um, always remained in my, uh, nearby, you know, when I needed him. You know, this is a, uh, I, I, this is a long story. They did give money to this film. But it was by forcing them to give money. And in fact, I sent my script without my name. And, when they dis and then when they discovered, and it, they, said this, they, they said it has been rejected, I put an Israeli lawyer from Tel Aviv, and I asked for the reviewers of the script, because they come from outside the CNC, from the government, from the, you know, what they call it, the fund. <clears throat> and then we, by law, you know, I requested to see the remarks of the readers. And it was judged positively and not negatively. But the fund said it was rejected. So the lawyer's job, and it was a, a, actually not, nothing to do with even a lefty lawyer. It's a very center uh, lawyer, but was also uh, as, uh, for civ civic issues and took the case because it was rather evident. And <clears throat> then they wanted to negotiate how much, and they normally give a certain amount of money. And they wanted to give me like a third of it or a quarter of it, because I was, uh, you know, who I was, an Arab, basically. And so it was a, quite a fight. And then when the film, the film almost, they stopped the funding many times, because, you know, they didn't like the film and didn't like the whole script. And when it was finished, um, it, you know, they stopped a few times also. I remember that um, there was a lot of threats and a lot of, uh, they wanted to put me in jail because I said that this film is Palestinian uh, and that was like a, a tabooed word at this moment and uh, they said if I say Palestinian that means by de facto I'm denying the existence, you know, bullshit like that. Um, <coughs> when they saw the finished film, they, they said this is not a film, it's a trash piece of work, you know, it's only sketches put together, whatever. Because they weren't, you know, I mean, look at, you know, anyhow. Um, and then what I did in order to save myself um, for threats of prison, actually, it was almost reached the Supreme Court, um, was that I, in Venice Film Festival, where the film premiered, I declared what I'm telling you now, but in a different words, because I was scared to go back after. And then the lawyer told me that, well, they can put you wherever they can put you, they can do whatever they want. But what I can do is settle it by um, threatening to make an international conference that this film that won the prize in Cannes, in Venice, uh, is being treated as such. So it was a moment of tension. And they realized that it was, it was going to be too noisy, the whole story. They even recorded every word I said to the press. When I went back to that fund to settle the account, um, the man who, who, who became, we became rather friends after for some reason. Um, and he, he regretted it and his wife told him that he doesn't know shit about cinema and all that. Um, and I liked the guy after and he was a Likud guy. The guy who was causing me all the trouble was a labor, you know, you normally left. And the guy who actually came to my side was a right wing. Uh, and when I went there, he, t he took a file so big, he said, let me show you. You know, every word I said in, was printed by the consulate, the Israeli consulate from Rome, and sent to them. So the, the agreement between us to finish the story was that I shut up, literally, they asked me that, that I will not ever badmouth them regarding this particular issue, and that they will not require me to call the film but Palestinian, and it was a deal. So here's the story. Not easy to make film when you are in these kinds of conditions, I have to tell you. And after that, I never ever, now they beg me sometimes, really come, you know, we love your work, you know, because they teach my films in Tel Aviv University, in Jerusalem, I mean, you know, kids in school are watching them all the time. 
And uh, a lot of professors always call me to, I mean, I did a seminar also in Tel Aviv. Um, I don't boycott, uh, I'm not an individual boycotter, you know, I might boycott state actions, but I have no purpose to boycott um, individuals. That's why I show my films in Israel also. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. And